listeners, my name is Esther Snippa from Speaker Hub. Speaker Hub is Europe's fastest growing network of speakers and trainers. In this series of podcast interviews, we feature some of our most interesting VIP speakers. They talk to us about their expertise and their projects and share with you ideas on how to become better communicators. Today I'm talking with Stuart Thompson. Stuart is an expert in public relations who helps organizations navigate the ever-changing world of politics and reputation. He offers some great advice to speakers who want to make their talks more relatable and what to avoid doing if you want to be engaging. So to start us off, Stuart, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Well, I started off with a degree in economics and politics. Um, I think mainly because I'd always been interested in politics, even from a, a much younger age, and I wanted to study it and learn more about it. But I think even back then I realised that the, the, the link between sort of what businesses do and economics in general and politics was so close that I needed to sort of know more about the economic side as, as well as the political. So I think the degree was, was an extremely useful one from that perspective. Uh, but at the end of the degree, what I really wanted to do was to keep studying. And, and in particular, I just wanted to look at parties, left-wing parties, and find out more about how they changed uh, in the post-war period. Um, now, when I finished the, the study, which was now a little while ago, as I, I betray my age, it was at one of those periods where left-wing parties were generally out of power, but it was just on the cusp of, of them coming back in. Um, and the difference that politics and politicians can make in those decision-making processes. So I think it was incredibly useful for what I do now, which is about helping organisations engage with sort of policy, regulation, politics, and to make the maximum use of their abilities to input into those decision-making processes and, and uh, influence decisions that governments make so that I believe fundamentally that you get better policy making, you get more rounded policy making and there's not so much of this sort of winners and losers type mentality but actually you know good decision making by politicians, by civil servants, officials, uh, by parliaments can deliver real benefits to communities and to countries. So I think I'm, 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 what I'm trying to do is help organisations uh, do that and impact meaningfully, but on the basis of actually understanding the politics and the decision making process and some of the economics behind it. So sorry, that's a rather long winded way of explaining why I think that, you know, I, I think what I did all those years ago in terms of studying actually is re still really useful uh, for what I do now. And Stuart, how do you go about helping these different organisations achieve those goals? Well, I suppose, I mean, it's in, in its simplest form, it's about helping organisations know who the people are they need to engage with and what motivates them, you know, what, what, but, but not just in terms of, I suppose, the pure politics of what they need to deliver, but also what's possible to deliver that. So very often that's down to the decision-making process and understanding the decision-making process and the pressures that that puts on the people taking the decisions. So the communications have to be effective, not just in terms of the messaging, but also the solutions that are delivered, you know, can what we want as an organisation really be delivered and how can that be delivered? So it's, it's unpicking the people and the processes to do something that, that can actually be done. And that, that's, I suppose, that's the heart uh, of what I do. And you then bolt onto that or, or as part of the uh, advice that I deliver is also about uh, reputations. And that's become increasingly uh, important over the years. What are some of the issues that organisations have when it comes to managing their reputations? There's a reputation in terms of what they do on a on a you know an everyday basis, the services they deliver, or the products they sell. You know whether they are they sort of do what they say they will do. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a sort of a basic premise, if you like. Then there's the wider you know reputation about how they treat people how they engage with organisations, how they engage with communities. And I think finally also with reputations, there's a, uh, an element of the unexpected, how they've planned for that and how they deal with those unexpected uh, circumstances. And 
there's also increasing, I think we've seen this much more in the last sort of six months, couple of years, a set of societal expectations about organisations that you can only understand if you understand what those motivations are and then you can feed those back into your decisions and uh, the way that you behave. So, I mean, I'll take tax as the, you know, the, the, the very current example, but frankly, if you're not delivering on your tax, communities, populations then go, hold on, what's going on here? The more that they cast a spotlight, the more the media um, ask questions, the more the politicians are forced into taking action. So we're talking about these big um, international corporations who aren't paying taxes in the various countries, yet making a fair bit of money and charging a fair bit of money for their products. You know, a lot of these things are very instinctive. You know, for, for populations across Europe, they, they, they see exactly that. You know, here's, a, here's an organisation which I'm very familiar with that tell me they're doing great things, but frankly they're not putting into my tax system. So I, you know, I can't go to my doctor or my hospital because mm -hmm. these large organisations are not paying their tax. I put it very brutally, but you know, that's, that's the sort of decision-making process behind which those organisations have to deal. Um, but it affects companies and organisations and charities and NGOs of whatever level. So that's that's a really stark example because of the size of these organisations. But you get similar types of issues, you know, right down the spectrum, regardless of size. And then, how do you help these companies manage manage these issues? Well, I mean, that that very much depends on the issue at hand. I mean, sometimes uh, it's about making sure they fully understand what they're getting into. And I think sometimes okay. there is a, a an absolute. Um, belief very often at the top of organisations that they know how to deal with politics, they know politicians mm. and therefore they'll see it through. Whereas actually that's fundamentally wrong. Uh, you, what you need to do is understand the decision making process and the attitudes of stakeholders and then you can try and work out what to say uh, you know, and what the solution to the problem is. Um, so it, it depends on the, on the nature of the issue but solutions and process and then coming forward with a plan, that's very often the sort of heart of what I end up uh, doing for organisations. And Stuart, can you tell me a bit about how communication has changed in your particular field when it comes to new marketing and social media? Well, I mean, politics, if I think, if I think about it in that sort of sense, is, is quite a strange beast, because on the one hand, when it comes to campaigning, you know, politicians sort of more or less understand the power of social media. So particularly if I take the UK example of the 2015 general election, the Conservative Party were very, very good at using, for instance, Facebook at targeting potential voters and getting tailored messages to them. And they spent a lot of money in doing that. However, the Labour Party didn't. Uh, they simply didn't prioritise it and spent a frankly pitiful amount of money as part of their overall election spend on social media. So mm. on the one hand, generally politicians I say with some exceptions, but generally get it in campaigning terms. I think what's different is, or what's not quite there yet, is actually politicians using it in a day-to-day -day basis. It's still very much, for many of them, uh, a way of pumping out information, whereas actually what it should be about is, is more genuine engagement, the, the dialogue side of things. Uh, I, I, what I would contend is it's, it's a good way of getting information about politicians and what their attitudes are, but it's not a good way of engaging with them. That bit of the social media equation from the political side of things is, is still coming. Do you see it moving more towards this? You would have a, uh, a more engaging relationship with the various politicians via their Twitter or Facebook? Sadly, I don't really see, I, I don't see that changing in any short order. I think that will take a good number of years. Um, I think particularly because, you know, the good examples are still a few. We just need more of those really good examples and then politicians will start to really engage with it and, and do it properly, so rather than just using it as some glorified uh, way of pumping out press releases. Mm. Yeah, it's just a, a speak soapbox, if you will, as opposed to a conversation. Exactly, and that, that conversation is exactly what they need to do. And I say some do it absolutely brilliantly and do engage, and they talk about themselves, and it's, it's much, more, much more personable. Uh, unfortunately, just too many don't, don't see it like that. Okay, Stuart, can we switch tax a little bit and talk a bit about your work as a public speaker? What are the topics that you generally speak about? To be honest, it tends to be a range of sort of political and business type issues, but particularly around uh, engagement with political audiences, 
crisis management, the media relations. It's it's those sort of areas. So it's it's the cusp of sort of business, politics, and reputation. And what I find is when I'm speaking, people like to hear not just sort of uh, you know about what they should do and what they shouldn't do, but actually what other people have done and some good examples as well. Uh, and my approach is always to try and keep them. You know, my my approach is, re is personable, uh, which hopefully sort of comes across in, in our conversation today. Uh, as well, rather than being just a sort of a, a to stand up and give a series of uh, quite serious slides. My approach is, is, you know, letting people engage in my talk as well. And I think politics and business, I mean, they can be quite serious. So how do you get your audience to engage with the content and the, the seriousness of the topic? I think I approach it by trying to just trying to unpick it. And I think trying to uh, get past some of the sort of preconceived ideas that you know you sort of have to go to the top in politics and that's the only way to do it actually if you give some examples and, and talk more widely about you know your own experience of engaging in 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 the sort of the influencing and, and reputational processes what you start to find is people go oh yeah no i, I sort of they start to recognize it and they start to sort of move beyond uh, you know, the, those sort of preconceived ideas that they came into the room with and suddenly it becomes a little bit more alive and you can engage people in a little bit slightly more light-hearted way. But it's about explanation and it's just about, very often it's about explaining things in a way that, you know, you don't, even, even from more senior people, frankly, you don't expect a sort of a huge amount of knowledge. So you don't, not, in a, not in a sort of talking down to people way, but it's sort of thinking, like, let's strip, let's strip away those preconceived ideas. Let's start with the basics and work our way up from that. Uh, and then you can make it that more lighthearted approach and you can get people to the end point that you're trying to get to at the end of the, at the, end of the talk. So that's, that's uh, generally the approach that I find that works best. That's a great insight. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. What is a common mistake that you see other speakers in your field make? Um, so whether it's using too much jargon or going in too heavy too fast, what are some of the mistakes you see them make and how do you avoid them? Uh, I think the jargon one is an absolutely, you, you've hit the nail on the head there, uh, too many people just assume that too much knowledge from the outset. I think that's, uh, you know, and they just drop into initials and phrases and whatever that, you know, just go completely over the head. Uh, and if you start that from the outset, then unfortunately you've lost the audience. I think there's also uh, sometimes from speakers, there's a degree of arrogance. Very often uh, not necessarily misplaced because they are experts. But, you know, if you allow that to come into the talk and the way that you engage with audiences, again, you'll lose them. A lack of examples sometimes as well. It simply becomes more of a lecture uh, and less mm. of a talk. I think the other thing is 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 the classic death pie PowerPoint is just people stick a load of stuff up on slides. However many talks you go to, people still put too many words on things, and you just fall asleep. Sadly, yeah, so, they just uh, stand probably... there and read the slides. <laughs> yeah. and, well, this is very helpful. Thank you. You know, that's the world's worst uh, sort of type of talk in my in my view. Mm. I empathise with that. Stuart, can you give me an example of one of the most effective talks you've given? I, I tell you what I really like doing, and it's uh, sometimes it's that cusp between talk and, and the training series that I do for the Chartered Institute of Public Relations on, on public affairs. And it's when you sort of see people that come into the room. Yes, I've got to do some slides, and there are some certain things that you you, know, you have to go through. But actually, it becomes much more of a dialogue during the course of, or in this instance, during the course of a day. And you can see them, the sort of the eyes almost light up during the course of that day because they realise that maybe what they've been doing isn't completely wrong. They've had some good ideas themselves, and I'm, you know, very happy to be, you know come out and say, look, no, that's a brilliant idea. You know, just do more of that. But they see it by the end of the day, they just know and understand more. They have a, a confidence in their own abilities that maybe they didn't have before and they just come out with some ideas some thoughts that they can take back to where they work and implement those thoughts now it's not up to me to sort of tell anybody how to sort of run an organization and you know they're the ex absolute experts in sort of what they do in their field but if i can make some suggestions push people along get them thinking in a slightly different way then that's the bit that i really like and that's the bit that i, I get from from particularly that training course for the cipr and I think, uh, you know, the comments back are always, you know, very positive. But I just like seeing people know at the end of that day that they, they can do something that 
you know it's not all really difficult really complicated but actually you can go back to your office and make a difference to your organization and mm. a part of your political engagement process so that's what i really like so it's that idea of making making it relevant for the audience that really inspires you yeah relevant the ideas and just giving the people the confidence to think about things you know it's not all smoke and mirrors it's not all really complicated and really difficult we can all do it but here are some thoughts about the way that you can do it and they can then go away back to their uh, offices you know and uh, look good to their bosses which is uh, you know fantastic i think well thank you for sharing that with me Stuart. my last question for today is what are your goals for the upcoming year what are you going to be working on on a personal level, I'm, I'm in the process of uh, just finishing off a new book, Public Affairs, a, a Global Perspective, which will be published through uh, Bain Publications, uh, hopefully sort of uh, March, April uh, this year, 2016. And what that does is it brings together different contributors writing about uh, public affairs in a number of countries. We've got the UK, France, Germany, Romania, uh, the European Union as well from different contributors, but also looking more globally as well. So Brazil, uh, US... Uh, Canada, New Zealand, China, uh, India as well, and I've probably forgotten a few there, so apologies to any of those contributors that I've um, in the Middle East um, as well, so any contributors that I've forgotten. Um, but that book should come out in the next couple of months, and that's a really exciting project, so it's one I've had in my mind for, for now a number of years, but actually uh, looking at what we all do as public affairs practitioners across the world, seeing if we do the same thing, do we do it slightly differently, are we talking about one sort of practice area, if you like, or are there no commonalities? So that was my exam question, if you like. Uh, mm. And that's what I've been able to explore uh, in this book and, and with the contributors as well. So that's, that's really exciting. That's what I'm, I'm particularly up for uh, over the next couple of months. Well, we wish you the best of success with the launch of your book. Thank you. Okay. This has been Esther Smith with Speaker Hub. If you have any questions or comments or would like to learn more about Steward as a speaker, please visit us at www.speakerhub.com.